and when I am by myself, the possibility that there's more people like this out there waiting to do this to me again lingers in my mind. Sure, material items were stolen, but that means nothing in comparison to the emotional damage this has caused for me. Every day for the rest of my life, I'll be putting back the pieces of the mess that was created. The independence I had before is completely gone. Um, Rick and Baby Slat, um, make sure you keep asking them about the money. Then we're still saying, hey, make sure you ask. And at this point, there were two names that were included. There were text messages after the incident in which both... And then they just kind of moved in at once and, and took everybody in who was, who was with them at that time. A back gate that led to a backyard that had maybe a sliding glass door left open. Number five, Montel Parker. Montel Parker, 17, was charged with first-degree criminal physical conduct, first-degree home invasion, and armed robbery after allegedly physically misconducting a Western Michigan University student at gunpoint during a home invasion and robbery. The police identified Parker and two other suspects through a cell phone selfie video recorded at a garage party shortly before the incident. The police recovered the cell phone from the passenger seat of the victim's stolen car, and messages found on the three suspects' Facebook accounts were also used to identify them. The victim had a physical exam at the YWCA hours after the event, and Parker's DNA was obtained upon his November 8 arrest on an unrelated charge in juvenile court. A 16-year-old teen was charged in juvenile court for home invasion and unlawful driving away from an automobile in connection to the second stolen car, but the third suspect, a juvenile, remained at large. The video showed the three suspects inside a garage with a table of audio equipment and a red X on the wall. The police contacted the homeowners and they verified the background matched the video. The video was recorded on October 2, 2021, about 90 minutes before the alleged home invasion and physical attack. The alleged victim's apartment was located at a nearby apartment complex. The victim was alone in her apartment when three masked men broke in, including Parker, who allegedly misconducted the 20-year-old student at gunpoint on October 3, 2021. The victim was told to stay in the bathroom during the robbery before Parker took her to the bedroom and misappropriated her with a gun with a green laser beam. During Parker's sentencing in Kalamazoo County Circuit Court, the victim said, Everything was taken from me that night. I'm talking about my sense of my security, and added that the incident has traumatized and changed her forever. And when I am by myself, the possibility that there's more people like this out there waiting to do this to me again lingers in my mind. Sure, material items were stolen, but that means nothing in comparison to the emotional damage this has caused for me. Every day for the rest of my life, I'll be putting back the pieces of the mess that was created. The independence I had before is completely gone. Every night before I go to bed, I triple check the locks on the door and latches on the window. My life has been permanently altered because of this, from needing to find a new car, to have and no, I'm not talking about my phone, or my watch, or even my car. I'm talking about my sense of security in my own home. Under no circumstance should I be going through the pain I was put through due to the actions of those involved in this. Everything was taken from me that night. Having my windows boarded up in my home is an extra measure of security. My ability to be okay being by myself. Judge Paul Bridenstein sentenced Parker to between 21 and a half years and 45 years in prison on charges of armed robbery and first-degree home invasion. Parker pleaded no contest to the charges after prosecutors agreed to drop a count of first-degree criminal physical attack and home invasion. Parker received 348 days for time served, and he was on juvenile court supervision at the time of the 2021 robbery. During Parker's sentencing, the judge referenced Parker's troubling juvenile history and stated that he had violated the sanctity of a person's most precious space in a horrifying manner. Meanwhile, the victim expressed the difficult-to-express feelings of being dehumanized by the experience of seeing the beam of the green laser. Number four, Lauren Riley and Lindsay Kalish. Two Life University lacrosse players faced a preliminary hearing for their alleged involvement in an armed robbery. During the hearing, Atlanta police detective Carlos Maldonado revealed a series of disturbing texts exchanged between the accused players, Lauren Riley and Lindsay Kalish, before and after the robbery took place. Um, Rick and Baby Slat. Um, make sure you keep asking them about the money. Then we're still saying, hey, make sure you ask. And at this point, there were two names that were included. There were text messages after the incident in which both... The exchange was initiated by Riley, who texted Kalish shortly after helping to survey the scene, asking why it was so alluring that the men were beating people up. Kalish responded that she wanted to sleep with one of the men who are accused of pistol whipping at least one man unconscious, fracturing his skull and leaving him lying in a pool of blood. The two women allegedly expected to be paid for their role in the robbery and later texted each other and the rapper Young Bands. 
who they had been hanging out with earlier that night, about getting the promised money. The incident began when Riley and Kalish received a Snapchat invitation to a party at an Airbnb house in the Reynoldstown neighborhood of Atlanta. The party reportedly had dozens of people earlier in the night, but by the time the two women arrived at 2 a.m., there were only seven people left. Two men, Max Pritchett, who is in custody, and another at-large suspect, allegedly decided to rob the partygoers after seeing money and drugs in the invitation. Riley and Kalish had been promised money to take the men to the party and scope things out by going in first. The women allegedly looked around the party uninterested in the other people, but interested in their surroundings. Riley left in a sprint and then drove suspiciously around the neighborhood with her lights off. The men then entered the party and committed the violent robbery, leaving several victims injured and robbed of their belongings. During the hearing, a Fulton County judge ruled that there was a probable cause for Kalish and Riley to be bound over for trial on charges of aggravated attack, home invasion, armed robbery, and aggravated battery. We've lived in our community for 20 years, and everybody here. She is, at this time, enrolled um, as a scholarship full-time athlete at Life University of Marietta, is that correct? That's right. The judge dropped several charges, including burglary, being involved in a gang, and using a gun in the commission of a felony. He also said that a grand jury may add back the charges he did not uphold. In a bond proceeding following the hearing, the two were denied bond. Number three, Bradley Yawn. Bradley Yawn, a Springfield man defending himself in a November 2021 physical attack case, will face trial 545 days after allegedly committing the crime. Yawn, however, has filed two motions for a change of venue and to dismiss the case. The hearing in Adams County Circuit Court saw a heated discussion around Yon's previous motion for the 22 transcripts of the hearings, which he claimed he did not receive. Assistant State's Attorney Josh Jones suggested that Yon was delaying the proceedings. Yon then argued that he was not delaying the proceedings, but wanted to have access to legal options to get out of jail sooner. The hearing then turned to a motion Yon filed that claimed discrepancies in the copies of several documents, videos, and audios he received as discovery. Jan claimed that the documents were doctored and played a recording of a statement given by Christina Tina Schmidt, the alleged victim. Members of Schmidt's family left the courtroom when the recording was played. Jan also claimed that deputies from the Adams County Sheriff's Department allowed people to walk through the crime scene for nearly 2.5 hours. Jan's debate continued as he claimed that the date of a copied computer file doesn't change the creation date of the file, adding more to his claim that documents were manipulated. Thompson ordered Jones to make the original copies of digital files available to Yon. Thompson reminded Yon that he could raise his argument during cross-examination at the trial. Yon then informed Thompson that he had given 17 motions to be heard. Yon's determination to delay the proceedings was apparent, and Assistant State's attorney, Jones, expressed concern that Yon was merely stalling the case. Number 2. John Baldwin It was a night that would change the lives of two brothers forever. September 18th started off like any other night for Adrianus Kusuma and his younger brother, but little did they know that their world was about to be turned upside down. Two men forced their way into their home on canvasback Glen Court, and what followed was a brutal attack that left one brother lifeless and the other fighting for his life. Adrianus Kusuma was a well-known restaurant owner in Spring, Texas. He and his brother ran the sunny side of the street restaurant, which was located just a half mile away from their home. Kusuma was loved by many in the community, and news of his passing sent shockwaves through the tight-knit town. For months, the case remained unsolved, but then police made a major breakthrough. They announced the arrest of 28-year-old John Baldwin, a Houston resident who was charged with capital slang. Baldwin was taken into custody and held in jail without bond, awaiting his court appearance the next day. The details of the crime were gruesome. Investigators believe that Baldwin and another man broke into Kusuma's home beat him and his brother and stole some cash before fleeing the scene in a white car. The brutality of the crime was shocking, and many in the community were left reeling. The arrest of John Baldwin brought a small measure of closure to the community, but it also served as a stark reminder of the fragility of life. For Adrianus Kusuma's family, the road to healing would be a long and difficult one, but they could at least take comfort in the fact that justice was served. Number 1. Thomas James Smith and Aaron David Rico III in 2016, a group of home invasion robbers wreaked havoc across northern San Diego, terrorizing residents in the middle of the night. For three weeks, the open-door bandits ransacked homes, bound and gagged their victims, and stole cash, gold, 
jewelry, and computers. But their reign of terror came to an end when police arrested seven members of the crew, including ringleaders Thomas James Smith and Aaron David Rico III. At their sentencing, the victims of these heinous crimes recounted the horror they endured. One woman, referred to as Jane Doe, forgave her attackers, despite being physically misappropriated and forced to shower away the evidence. But the judge did not share her mercy. Scary, scary night. We completely and understand. And I, I understand this was a very... I'm so nervous and I, I still in my, my head, you know. Weber handed down a sentence of 135 years to life in prison for Smith and 60 years to life for Rico III, calling them vicious and extraordinarily violent. The trial was not without controversy, as the defense argued that new evidence should have been presented, including the discovery of a victim's wallet with DNA belonging to a man not suspected in the robberies. And then they just kind of moved in at once and, and took everybody in who was, who was with them at that time a back gate that led to a backyard that had maybe a sliding glass door left open, which progressed to assault. A garage door opener left in a car that could get in through the garage. What started out as car burglaries turned into home burglaries where they stayed downstairs and didn't wake up the residents who were sleeping. They had just been following around two or three people. They always went in through unlocked or open doors which progressed to holding people up at gunpoint. Judge Weber condemned the failure of the police crime lab to notify the prosecutor of this evidence as a terrible flaw in the system. For the victims of the open door bandits, justice may have been served, but the scars of their trauma remain. James Mott feared for his life during the invasion of his home, while Betsy Huntington still wakes up in the middle of the night, wondering if she's heard something. For these residents of San Diego, the nightmare may never truly be over. That's all for today, folks. See you next time.